The Lord's Supper is Christianity's sacrament that reminds us of what the true message of Jesus Christ is. That Jesus came to this earth, lived and died for all people of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Jesus forever did away with the idea that God is reserved only for a select few. Jesus reminds us that God loves us all and God created us equal. Can you imagine if Jesus came to this earth proclaiming anything but gospel? What if Jesus had come here and said, I have come here so that only the ultra-religious might be saved, so that those who are good enough might know me? That's not gospel, that's law. Instead, Jesus brought a radically different message. Jesus came so that all people might participate in the resurrection of Christ and experience the love of God. The physical and tangible life of Christ, which is symbolized in the Lord's Supper, is the bond by which all humanity is unified. There is a place for every person at the table of the Lord where we partake in the Lord's Supper. It is our calling as Christians to remind people that Jesus came for all of us, that we are all equal, that we are created by God, and that God loves us all. We are unified through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is Christianity's sacrament that reminds us of what the true message of Jesus Christ is. That Jesus came to this earth, lived and died for all people of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Jesus forever did away with the idea that God is reserved only for a select few. Jesus reminds us that God loves us all and God created us equal. Can you imagine if Jesus came to this earth proclaiming anything but gospel? What if Jesus had come here and said, I have come here so that only the ultra-religious might be saved, so that those who are good enough might know me? That's not gospel, that's law. Instead, Jesus brought a radically different message. Jesus came so that all people might participate in the resurrection of Christ and experience the love of God. The physical and tangible life of Christ, which is symbolized in the Lord's Supper, is the bond by which all humanity is unified. There is a place for every person at the table of the Lord where we partake in the Lord's Supper. It is our calling as Christians to remind people that Jesus came for all of us, that we are all equal, that we are created by God, and that God loves us all. We are unified through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper is Christianity's sacrament that reminds us of what the true message of Jesus Christ is. That Jesus came to this earth, lived and died for all people of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Jesus forever did away with the idea that God is reserved only for a select few. Jesus reminds us that God loves us all and God created us equal. Can you imagine if Jesus came to this earth proclaiming anything but gospel? What if Jesus had come here and said, I have come here so that only the ultra-religious might be saved, so that those who are good enough might know me? That's not gospel. Growing up, I didn't play a lot of sports, but my husband did. He played basketball and he was the center. It was his job to be all about the defense. He was to rebound, he was to make sure the other team didn't get shots. Now, that meant that he didn't get a lot of shots on the score sheet. So when everybody else was bragging about the points that they made, he couldn't join in. As a matter of fact, the games where he made a lot of points, the team usually lost. But the games where he didn't get a lot of points, those were the games that he won because he was spending his time doing what he was supposed to do. Not shooting, but being about the defense. He had to learn early that the goal was more important than the role. He might not have gotten the award for having the most points in the game, but you weren't getting by him because his defense was tight. God has blessed every believer with spiritual gifts. And although we don't all have the same gifts, the Bible says that God put all the gifts in the body of Christ the way that he sees fit. 
We can't get caught up with what gift we have and what gift someone else has. God in his wisdom blessed us and that thought alone should excite us. We get to be co-laborers with Christ to build up the kingdom of God and that goal is much more important than all of the roles. Growing up, I didn't play a lot of sports, but my husband did. He played basketball and he was the center. It was his job to be all about the defense. He was to rebound, he was to make sure the other team didn't get shots. Now, that meant that he didn't get a lot of shots on the score sheet. So when everybody else was bragging about the points that they made, he couldn't join in. As a matter of fact, the games where he made a lot of points, the team usually lost. But the games where he didn't get a lot of points, those were the games that he won because he was spending his time doing what he was supposed to do. Not shooting, but being about the defense. He had to learn early that the goal was more important than the role. He might not have gotten the award for having the most points in the game, but you weren't getting by him because his defense was tight. God has blessed every believer with spiritual gifts. And although we don't all have the same gifts, the Bible says that God put all the gifts in the body of Christ the way that he sees fit. We can't get caught up with what gift we have and what gift someone else has. God in his wisdom blessed us and that thought alone should excite us. We get to be co-laborers with Christ to build up the kingdom of God. And that goal is much more important than all of the roles. Growing up, I didn't play a lot of sports, but my husband did. He played basketball and he was the center. It was his job to be all about the defense. He was to rebound, he was to make sure the other team didn't get shots. Now, that meant that he didn't get a lot of shots on the score sheet. So when everybody else was bragging about the points that they made, he couldn't join in. As a matter of fact, the games where he made a lot of points, the team usually lost. But the games where he didn't get a lot of points, those were the games that he won because he was spending his time doing what he was supposed to do. Not shooting, but being about the defense. He had to learn early that the goal was more important than the role. He might not have gotten the award for having the most points in the game, but you weren't getting by him because his defense was tight. God has blessed every believer with spiritual gifts. And although we don't all have the same gifts, the Bible says that God put all the gifts in the body of Christ the way that he sees fit. We can't get caught up with what gift we have and what gift someone else has. God in his wisdom blessed us and that thought alone should excite us. We get to be co-laborers with Christ to build up the kingdom of God. And that goal is much more important than all of the roles. Growing up, I didn't play a lot of sports, but my husband did. He played basketball and he was the center. It was his job to be all about the defense. He was to rebound, he was to make sure the other team didn't get shots. Now, that meant that he didn't get a lot of shots on the score sheet. So when everybody else was bragging about the points that they made, he couldn't join in. As a matter of fact, the games where he made a lot of points, the team usually lost. But the games where he didn't get a lot of points, those were the games that he won because he was spending his time doing what he was supposed to do. Not shooting, but being about the defense. He had to learn early that the goal was more important than the role. He might not have gotten the award for having the most points in the game, but you weren't getting by him because his defense was tight. God has blessed every believer with spiritual gifts. And although we don't all have the same gifts, the Bible says that God put all the gifts in the body of Christ the way that he sees fit. We can't get caught up with what gift we have and what gift someone else has. God in his wisdom blessed us and that thought alone should excite us. We get to be co-laborers with Christ to build up the kingdom of God. And that goal is much more important than all of the roles.
Growing up, I didn't play a lot of sports, but my husband did. He played basketball and he was the center. It was his job to be all about the defense. He was to rebound, he was to make sure the other team didn't get shots. Now, that meant that he didn't get a lot of shots on the score sheet. So when everybody else was bragging about the points that they made, he couldn't join in. As a matter of fact, the games where he made a lot of points, the team usually lost. But the games where he didn't get a lot of points, those were the games that he won because he was spending his time doing what he was supposed to do. Not shooting, but being about the defense. He had to learn early that the goal was more important than the role. He might not have gotten the award for having the most points in the game, but you might. How does God communicate with us? Through the scriptures primarily, through his written word, but also through nature, through divine providences, through impressions on the heart from the Holy Spirit. But God also communicates to us through his servants, the prophets. Many decades ago, I read the little book, Steps to Christ, the most published devotional book ever written by Ellen G. White. That experience revolutionized my life. I have renewed that relationship with Jesus virtually every day since by reading first the scriptures and then the writings of Ellen White, a few pages every day. I have found that not only does she help me understand who Jesus is and how much he wants me to be in heaven, but also how to apply the principles of the Bible in my everyday life. I find her to be a practical, common sense prophet. I challenge you to read Ellen White's writings and find if they are not an agency that God uses not only to direct you to his heart of love, but also to the scriptures, to the written revelation of his will. I have found for myself that the writings of the prophets not only strengthen my desire and my will to know and obey and love God with all my heart, but also Not to long ago, I was traveling in New York City and I saw a sign on the subway. It had all the numbers for the code and said, the law says, don't spit on the floor. Now it's amazing that I go to a lot of buildings and I don't see any signs that say don't spit on the floor. I guess the signs are there because they need them there to help regulate behavior because you probably wouldn't want to have a lot of people spitting on the floor. Do you know that God has given us gracious instruction to help us live in the best way? That instruction that comes in the Bible and the Ten Commandments and the life of Jesus shows us the best way to live. But you know, God doesn't want us just to look at that instruction and say, oh, I guess I better do it because God said so. He wants us to recognize that that really is the best way to live. And he puts his spirit in us so that we come to want to live the way that would be best for us. Now, would you rather live in a place where they have to put signs on the wall to say don't spit on the floor? Or would you rather live in a place where people just don't do that because they really don't want to? Wouldn't it be nice if we could live in a place where everyone accepted God's gracious instruction and lived the way that he knows is best for us? Not long ago, I was traveling in New York City and I saw a sign on the subway it had all the numbers for the code and said, the law says, don't spit on the floor. Now it's amazing that I go to a lot of buildings and I don't see any signs that say, don't spit on the floor. I guess the signs are there because they need them there to help regulate behavior because you probably wouldn't want to have a lot of people spitting on the floor. Do you know that God has given us gracious instruction to help us live in the best way? That instruction that comes in the Bible and the Ten Commandments and the life of Jesus shows us the best way to live. But you know, God doesn't want us just to look at that instruction and say, oh, I guess I better do it because God said so. He wants us to recognize that that really is the best way to live. And he puts his spirit in us so that we come to want to live the way that would be best for us. Now, would you rather live in a place where they have to put signs on the wall to say don't spit on the floor? Or would you rather live in a place where people just don't do that because they really don't want to? 
Wouldn't it be nice if we could live in a place where everyone accepted God's gracious instruction and lived the way he
Remember when you were in school and you would get one of these from someone you liked? Every day you would wait in anticipation to receive that love letter from that special someone. I remember getting them when I was in school, in middle school, in high school. And I know it's going to sound a little sentimental, but I would actually keep them in a binder. Hey, I know you've probably done the same thing too. As I would read each letter, I got to know the person who wrote it, and it was almost as if that person was right there speaking to me. Today we get these messages in Facebook, through an email, or through a text message. Did you know that God speaks to us through the Bible today? They're His collection of love letters written for us. The Holy Scriptures are 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, in them God speaks directly Himself to us. How do I know this? Because every morning I spend quality time with God in the Bible listening to Him speak to me. In these sacred love letters, I get to know what God is like. I see in them His character of love, and I also get to discover His wonderful plan of salvation. But the best thing of all about the Bible, God's love letters, is that in them, I've come to know Jesus Christ personally. And friend, it's my prayer that as you read the Bible, you'll get to know Him too. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 14, verse 13, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Let's pray. Dear Father, we pray that you will be here with us today. And we just thank you that you are because you promised it. We've gathered here together to worship you and to seek your face. And so we thank you, Lord, that you're here in our midst and that you will bless us this day. May you, may we do your will more fully each day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Came home from work and he pulled in the driveway and parked his truck and his neighbor was calling him to come over. And he went over and to see what was wrong in front of his truck. Laying on the ground, calling him to come over. Looking around, and that's really funny. And he thought, boy, he looks like he might have rabies or 
or something. And so the Pitar and he were doing a hymn to the people who were called veterinarians. The father met with Miriam and uh, that told him where they were and how to take a look at him. And he, they were going, and the big guy was really afraid something was going to be wrong with him. And that was probably because he had babies, they were going to have to put him to sleep. So they could check his brain to see if he had it. But when uh, Wayne went to pick his dog up, he came into the truck and kind of scratched his face and got a little of a foam on his face. So he was a little bit worried about it. But the humans can get that too. We went to the vet and the vet told him, bring him on in and I'll uh, take a look at him. And um, he looked at the dog, he felt his toy, he says, the dog has a chicken bone in his throat, two inches long. So he put his finger in there, pulled the bone out, the dog was fine. He was happy. And the man, uh, Wayne was really happy for, for because now he didn't have to do anything to his dog. So I put him in the truck, and the dog's sitting up there like he's a king. He's smiling, it looked like he was smiling anyway. And uh, he was thanking God that uh, things came out all right. That he had such a special pet that found what was wrong with him so quick. And I, well, do you know anybody special that can help you? Like you need something special? Something that can help you? Only two and two and Doctors, nurses, teachers, and your parents probably know somebody special they can call on too. They can always call on God to help them out, and He will help them to find somebody that they need to help them out. And we need to thank God to give Him glory for all that He does for us. Somebody Dear God, thank you for the beautiful day. Um, thank you for the children's story. Thank you for blessing us to be good listeners in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Lord, we're thankful for being here, <laughs> having the children here. It was so nice to have little ones. We know they're special people. We pray that you will bless all of the people in church today. And uh, have a blessing and go out and be with you in Jesus. Amen.
he gets close to home, then it's just everything. It's everything. Nobody's safe. I love you, Heavenly Father, we kneel before you today, recognizing and acknowledging our great need for you, that you are our God and we are your people. We thank you and praise you so much that you do every day for us. You give us breath. You keep our heart beating. And you provide all the other things that we think are so vital to us. And the things that are vital, but you give us so much more. And we thank you for, it, for all the blessings that you bring our way every day. I pray for each person here today. We all have heavy burdens that we carry, Father. Some of us share them, some of us don't. But we all have something weighing on our hearts that we want to bring to you this morning and lay at your feet. Because we know that that's the only place that we can find help in time of need. So each one of us, Lord, who is has loved ones that are in sickness, we pray, Lord, that you will bless them and touch them in a special way. Each one of us who is suffering loss from someone who has passed away, whether it be from disease, natural causes, drug overdoses, poor choices, whatever it is, Lord, we lift them up to you now and pray that you will bring comfort to each one of us for those things. Each one of us, Lord, who has loved ones that are struggling with issues that are critical, critical to their life and salvation, we pray for a special blessing upon them. We pray for our young people, Lord, who are, who are facing decisions, who are trying to work things out and figure out what life is about. We pray, Lord, that you will come especially close to them and reveal yourself to them in a way that will make it real for them so that they will have their own faith. They'll be able to have their own faith and not trust and lean on mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. We pray that you will show yourself. We pray for the ministries that we are working on, Lord. We pray that this thing that we are beginning this week, that we will throw all of our heart into it so that we can truly be your hands and feet, that we can love people who are facing problems that Sometimes we don't even understand, but sometimes we understand all too well. We pray, Lord, that you will bless this ministry that we are about to begin. So I pray for the pastor in Brooklyn, his granddaughter, Nancy's friends, for Sherry Hallbank, Lord, for the King family. We pray and thank you and praise you for those who have been united, Angela's friends and, and students. And for Joe's co-worker, Lord, who needs help. And for Jesse, who's looking for work. Pray for every single one of these, Lord. And just thank you that you are so good. And that you have a plan in place for each one of those needs. And we pray that we will trust you to accept it. And thank you for what you bring. And we just praise your name in everything. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. Our scripture passage, the password is selected for a message today. It tells an interesting story, ending with a question. Who's going to battle with the force today? It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What are you reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Good to be with you here today. Uh, with me outside, but that's okay. One thing we can be thankful for is that it is getting warmer. Amen. And uh, we appreciate that uh, very, very much. Um, one of the things I think we forgot to mention um, when we were talking about the Drugs Close to Home project, uh, and that is that this Wednesday. We've asked you to fast from Monday through Wednesday. But then this Wednesday, we want to have a special prayer meeting. It will be at the Willoughby Church. We're asking you to join us there. Uh, that will be at 6 p.m. Um, join us there so we can have prayer uh, and just kind of ask the, the concentration of the Holy Ghost to, uh, to come on us as a group. And uh, um, that what we're about to embark on will be uh, successful. So that's Wednesday, the 5th, this week, at uh, uh, Willoughby at 6 p.m. And again, please, we are asking that, uh, with the Lord's help, you choose some form of fasting um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as we lead up to this event. We had um, in our youth class today uh, Shanti, Anjali, and uh, Patrick. And um, this is a class that uh, you can call uh, Bible studies slash discussions. The PET class um, can lead to uh, baptism. Uh, it's primarily, primarily designed uh, to help our young people apply the Bible in their daily lives. The class is being approached from their vantage point. The things that go on in their lives, the things that go on in their peer groups, the things that uh, they are faced with in this world that are clearly different than most of us adults. And how they try to respond and in some way, if pastor can help that by applying God's word. So we want you to pray for that. Um, they will continue to let me know if this is something they want to continue to do. It's all up to them and um, uh, how we proceed. I am wishing that we can get more consistency in how often we do it. I've asked for their help to see uh, if that can be done. I don't know if it's a... Uh, um, some kind of a Sunday brunch. These are very casual things. I have no idea. I may uh, um, 
Cheryl, I may need to sit down with you and talk about how um, this might fit into path. I, I don't know. I'm just coming off the top of my head, but it's certainly a discussion worth having to just develop something that a little more continuous since I'm only able to be here uh, once in the month. Um, we will be at Willoughby next week, um, and but it's very difficult for me to try to hold it at each church each week. It's a different grouping. So I mean, right now we're just starting. It was, it, was, it was just being done simply to say, to try to reach out to uh, our young people that, like I said, uh, they are facing things. Age group, uh, it runs approximately uh, 13 to about uh, 21, 22. Uh, even in that difference of age, uh, they're, they're, they're all either getting ready to go out to the world or they're beginning to be out there. Our young people, uh, praise the Lord and to the parents and all that. Our young people are not in trouble. It's the word they're going out to that has the trouble. And uh, uh, just trying to aid that as best we can. My mission when I started to be a minister has never changed. And that is to make the Bible applicable to daily living. I, 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 that was my prayer to the Lord. That's what I've always tried to do. And in conversation or whatever, can we make the Bible applicable to daily living? So that allows us to have discussions that are totally open and then ask God to help us apply his word to those discussions. So in that way, it's not your traditional approach to Bible study. And yet today, uh, our primary discussion was about faith. So it will always include God's going to pray for that, uh, please. Um, and I, I would appreciate that. But more than that, pray for our young peace. God loves us all. And yet it would appear that the Lord has certain designations, I guess I'll call it. The allowance of certain conditions for some of us that are better or worse than others. In a world where the less fortunate are categorized as unlucky, missing the right opportunities, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, a world where the general philosophy is life is what you make of it, The less fortunate are a group of people who seem to depend on the more fortunate when all they have to do is work it out for themselves. Do we believe that the poor are poor by choice? I used to believe that, but reading my Bible suggests to me that our designation on this earth is not so much of our choice or what we make of it, but instead it's what God allows. God allows it, but we may be able to play a role in it. In fact, I'm confident that we are because of our belief in a loving Savior. Let us pray. Now, Lord, be with us and continue to help us seek the ways as you did when you were here to reach out to our community and help those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it was uh, 
Jesus who actually said that the poor you will always have with you. A savior in control of this world says we'll always have poor people. A savior who could eliminate poverty says we'll always have poor people. But he said it post Garden of Eden. <laughs> and he said it in a now very sinful and selfish world. But what it tells me is that there is a reason for that designation. And it's probably because if there was not if there was not that, we who have would just go ballistic. And we would never think of anything else or anyone else but ourselves. Deuteronomy 15, 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in the land. God is speaking here to Moses and the children of Israel about God's position, God's position on the need. Now, in general, I believe most Christians have no trouble accepting the Lord's position. We do believe in helping the needy. That is not an issue. Most governments worldwide, the United States being the greatest with social programs, believe it is the responsibility of a government to have programs that address help for the need. Our country remains in political debate of just how much or how little, but there is no question that our government recognizes recognizes the need to help those less fortunate. But today's question is, who is thy neighbor? I am stretched to the limit to where helping myself need attention. Maybe some of you believe that welfare is needed, but the system needs an overall because of the abuses found in the system. Uh, some of those abuses are so blatant that those in need really never benefit from the program. It never trickles all the way down. And in instances where the needy receive federal assistance, the red tape, the red tape seems insurmountable. Let's just concern ourselves with our own. <laughs> Who is our own? That could be race, culture, religion, team, or simply our own kind. Let's in the army. Regardless of my seven races, my designation in the army was quite amazing. And so when you're grunts, you start out and you do the various labors, but there was a separation for some who get worse labor and then easier. And so we are all in the kitchen and we're mopping floors and a Caucasian sergeant comes in and he sees me and he says what are you doing here and I said sergeant I'm just doing what I was assigned to do he said you come with me and he took me back in the kitchen kitchen and he said you're going to be you don't want to be mopping floors you're going to be fixing style and things like that. We take care of our own. Who is my neighbor?
Is my neighbor just someone that I know and like and associate with? What kind of person are you? What kind of neighbor are you when it comes to considering your fellow neighbor? Or have you not determined what constitutes your name? Since today's parable is told by Jesus, let's put this parable in the context of which it was when he told it. Christ's Object Lessons, page 376. Among the Jews, the question, who is my neighbor, caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. They were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priests, the rabbi, the elder regard as neighbor? They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude they taught would cause defilement that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as their neighbors? Are you getting that picture? It was even, in a sense, in their society, in their cultural wrong to help someone not of their same status. And yet, they were there as a church to help the needy, as long as you don't touch it. I was challenged with that when I was in India. After we were going to bless the attendance, we were having healing prayers at the end of each night's meeting. I face some things in life that people coming through the line, there were some near, some real needs for healing. They wanted hands on healing. And quite frankly, some of the diseases and things that I saw, I'm thinking, uh, Lord, I, I don't know about this. In this section of the country, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to come away from something. God was with me because at that same time, I said, you know what, Lord? You sent me here on a mission. Whatever happens to me, you allow it. Help me focus on why I'm here. And so I did. And so we did hands on because I did not realize that God was preparing me to see people healed. I would have missed out on an experience that I raised in the church, only thought we believe, you know. But I'd never seen it apply. And so the Holy Spirit used me in a couple instances. And I was so grateful to lend myself that way. A sinner who's also diseased with sin. You see, it's all on your perspective. And I got such a great blessing out of it. Of that. It is in this environment, this cultural prejudice, that the parable of the Good Samaritan garners its significance. Just like today, there are those during Jesus' time who felt they've met the obligation due to the neighbor. And so their responsibility to the need is complete. Jesus encountered such an individual. He was well off. And quite satisfied that he had met his responsibility to his fellow man. And certainly there was no room to even consider 
those who might be considered enemies of the Jews. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so we pick up where Jesus is in front of this crowd of people, which kind of really built as he went along. And of course, his his, his group of Pharisees followed him around and said to these because they envied so much the attention he drew. And they were always behind trying to figure out some way to set him up. <coughs> On this occasion, the Bible suggests that the young man who had asked the question sought to set up Jesus for failure. And Jesus calmly accepted the trap, knowing full well the young man's intentions. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Jesus says, you're intelligent. You seem to be well-read. You know the law. How do you read it? What do you say it says? Yeah, Jesus, I, every time I read the four Gospels and read about Jesus, I mean, he, this is a master strategist. I mean, he, he it just, and, and I, I, I say it has to be his relationship with God the Father. He always talked about that. Everything he did, everything he thought, everything he was trying to accomplish was with the help of the Lord. He turned to God. I, I think we can be that way. You know, like if, if we did, we, we, we jump out there first. At least I'll just speak for me. I jump out there first thinking I'm too smart. When all we have to do is call upon the Lord. He never gave away what he was about to do until it was exactly the right time to do so. So Jesus was the master of turning the tables around. He always did something that would suggest, okay, I did that. But he answered you in a way that threw the ball back in your court. The young warrior was now trapped in his own trap trying to bait Jesus. He now had been baited by the master with his own deception. And I'm sure none of us in here would ever even consider trying to fool the Lord or outsmart or outstrategize Jesus. But sometimes we do get a little dig for our bridges and we think we have a better plan designed for us. And so that's how sometimes we are headed in a direction that the Lord did not design because we have a better way. We want to serve the Lord. We want to do what Jesus wants us to do. We just want to do it our own way. Let me help you with that. You cannot outmaster the master. You can fool me, your friends, family, and other church members, but up front with Jesus is really the best way to go and have a relationship toward your own salvation. The young man determined to show he could be more clever than Jesus says, oh sure, I, I know the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. At that point, he's doing pretty good. If he would just let him go at that point, he still looked good in front of the crowd and, and the Pharisees who put him up to this trap. But no. Continuing his effort to look smarter than Jesus without, without seeking conviction or a contrite heart. The young lawyer asked the question that nailed, put the nails in his own coffin. Who is my neighbor? It was kind of an insult. I'm doing everything. I'm not doing everything. I'm doing it for everyone that's my neighbor, but it seems like you don't think so. So who is my neighbor? Christ. Object Lessons, page 378 and 379, rather than acknowledge the truth, he endeavored to show how difficult the fulfillment in the commandment is. Thus, he hoped both to parry conviction to vindicate himself in the eyes of the people. The Savior's words had shown that his question was needless, since he was able to answer himself, and yet he put the question, who is my name? It's also not wise to try to outsmart somebody who is not trying to outsmart you. And Jesus is already smarter than us, so he has no reason to play in those little games. 
be hitting straight forward. When we come open and honest about ourselves with Jesus, that's all we need. We are coming to the one that John says steps in our place as a propitiation. He just takes our place for our sins. A Savior who takes our sinfulness upon himself and justifies us in front of God when we don't deserve it. It was time for the young man to learn a lesson in the most innocent yet cunning way in which Jesus always allows us to trap ourselves when we are intent, when our intent is suspect. So Jesus tells this parable. Traveler goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Along the way, he is overtaken by thieves and they give him a whipping. Really bad. Plus, take everything that he has, and they actually leave him for dead. Later, a, piece, a priest passes by, and rather than deal with the obvious need, he crosses to the other side as if he didn't see him. And continued his journey. Soon after that, a Levite comes by. He actually went over and stopped and looked. Hmm. This guy looks like he's in bad shape. He looks like he needs help. Well, I'm sure somebody will come along and do that. He likes it. He gets along. Finally, a Samaritan stopped by, took care of his soul in need. He took care of him so well that he not only took him to an inn where he could clean up and rest, but then told the innkeeper, if he needs anything, anything at all, let me know. I'll take care of it on my return. Jesus then asked the young ruler, which of these three demonstrated the acts of the neighbor? And the young man responded, the one who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, you go and do the same. Game, set, match. The battering is over, the congratulatory accolades and self-exaltations done, the question looms into the spotlight, who is my neighbor? The answer lies in not designating who, but defining what is a neighbor. I can't clarify who is my neighbor if I don't know what a neighbor is. Dictionary definition is quite simple. A person who lives next to or near another person. <laughs> Apply the parable to Webster and the question of who is my neighbor has an obvious answer. Anyone in that range. Anyone in that range. <coughs> Your next door neighbor I know this is difficult. <laughs> uh, I still Your next door neighbor doesn't have to be any food or clothes. Because no matter what his or her condition is, your next door neighbor needs Jesus. And that's not so bad because then that puts us equal with them. Amen? We all need Jesus. I certainly feel I can do better. I'm on the board of the Neighborhood Association. In fact, we just had a meeting this past week. I am the secretary. I have turned down the presidency twice just because my responsibilities are too great to try to handle. The, the daily business that goes along with keeping up with the laws and bylaws of the association, which is owned by the housing development, which is governed by the city of Brunswick, on and on. So I just said I would be satisfied coming to the meetings, taking our minutes, keeping them on file, and so forth. They want me to do that. Because they know that I'm a minister and that I've brought to the group 
something extra that they don't deal with a lot. And that is a logic that I told them when they asked me, well, what is your opinion? I apply my logic of the Bible. And they find that interesting. And I try to answer it, not always giving the Bible study, but that's the way it is. That's, that's how I apply things. <clears throat> Simply and direct. They, it cuts down like a lot of long discussions. In my neighborhood, uh, most people know I'm a pastor because I certainly don't hesitate to let them know that if it comes to that, the little kids <laughs> call me pastor. And so I'm just calling by my first name. I'm not their pastor. So I just let that kind of flow how it is. But, but, but I haven't shared any scripture or anything like that so the Lord and I remain in discussion about now just how are you do you want to use me in this neighborhood? The knowledge of that I know Jesus, there might be a step further. Because my neighbor is anyone next door or near to me. And we live in a world that suggests that the Bible is a fairy tale and not even true. And that if you go to church, just keep that to yourself. Why? Why? And when you, as soon as you mention the Sabbath or Saturday, they're thinking, oh, man, one of those groups. So in a sense, I know that you face this. We're kind of up against it as to how far do we go to share who we know and what we believe. Before you get, I don't want you to get depressed or anything. This is a very individual thing. But yet, there are many ways to reach out. Amen? Many, many ways. And it might be in conversation, but in case you haven't thought about it yet, this drugs folks at home thing just might be your ticket in signing up to be on one of the teams. It's made national news. It's big. Northeast Ohio, having an opium addiction. None of us in here are experts, either from the counseling vantage point or the user vantage point. The user doesn't make you an, ex uh, uh, an expert. It makes you a victim. But prayer is a powerful thing. It may seem strange. I did like what I heard during prayer requests. Different ones of you bringing up friends or neighbors. Amen. <laughs> that you want pray for. That's not small. Prayer is big. It's a powerful thing. And remember, you believe in prayer. And think about how the Lord used you for that friend or neighbor to come to you and ask for prayer. And even if they didn't, you brought it here today and you do regularly every Saturday. Don't take that lightly. Prayer is big for this project, prayer, where you can get involved. There's some comfort zone stuff involved in that. Let's let's forget about the fact that the young lawyer was trying to trap Jesus. Let's Forget about that once he was caught, he tried to vindicate his selfish attitude by saying Jesus, by saying he's already living up to all the law requires. Put aside the possibility that Jesus told this parable while the priest and the Levite stood in the crowd. This parable is a true story. It had just happened, this incident, a few hours before. And Jesus is now relating it. And again, Jesus being so smart, he was probably doing it because he saw those people in the crowd. But all that aside, the Good Samaritan is a parable teaching us
to do things from the heart. How to apply true love and caring without prejudice or concern of being noticed and awarded the title hero. We hear that so much today. It seems like this world lacks heroes. So every little thing they've done, he was a hero. You know, we never can just say this was just that was the right thing to do and a good thing to do. We have to be a hero. I don't even know why that's necessary. But man, again, is always looking some way to bring attention and accolades to himself for the things he do. Maybe society in general is so guilty of all the sin that they're involved in. When somebody rises, we get to attach ourselves to that. I always love the instances where they tell of the survival and he got out of it. And, and so, you know, like the one guy that had to actually cut off his own arm to, to get released from that, you know, and when they asked the question, how could you do that? What made you do that? He said, it was just, it was just the will to live. Somebody better learn how to say Jesus. Somebody better learn how to apply these fantastic, unbelievable survivor events to my faith in God. But we always want to promote ourselves as heroic Christ offering blessings. Pages 3 and 3 and 3 and 4 by no selfish practices can the cause of Christ be served. <clears throat> his cause is the cause of the oppressed and the poor. In the hearts of his professed followers, there is need. Of the tender sympathy of Christ. These souls are precious, infinitely more precious than any other offering we can bring to God. To bend every energy towards some apparently great work while we neglect the needy or turn the stranger from his right is not a service that will meet his approval. We want to grow the church. We want to grow the district. We'd like to see more people in the pews. We want to come up with things that would, you know, head in that direction. Sometimes I think I'm not sure we should do any of those things for that. But that if we serve our community and do the right thing and make ourselves known and share Christian love, God will take care of that. I don't know how. I don't know the mind of God. I just know I cannot set my own goal when it comes to the Lord. I cannot set my own purpose when it comes to the Lord because my purpose has already been set. Uh, I think it's in, it's in Isaiah and it might be chapter 14, 26. I'm not sure. But God expresses that he's the one that has set the purpose. He has set the desire for us. We got one thing to do. Say, Lord, I, I, I'll serve. And in any capacity, don't limit yourself, but at the same time, I'm not going to stand here and say, you need to be going knocking door to door. Quite frankly, that's a good way to get arrested today. Because cities have solicitation laws Oh, well, Satan's doing it. He's doing a thing. Why? Because he knew we wouldn't quit. So he's come up with all kinds of ways to restrict us doing what the Lord has put us here to do. It's close. Close. Like says, I was off one verse. So go Serving our neighbor and attending to the needy can confront our comfort zone. We have lives too. We have things to attend to pressing in our lives. We're up against it too. But the Christian 
The disciple of Jesus knows something that me and suffering can't even begin to consider. Not to mention, know with faith and certainty. By faith, the follower of Jesus knows what prayer and faith in Jesus can do. A disciple of Jesus knows the power, has experienced the power. Had we not all in here prayed for something, and when it concerns our needs, when it comes to the Lord, and had those things not been answered or provided, I think we can find a witness in every individual in here. This is about first making the knowledge known that Jesus loves and cares and is coming back for believers. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me and then let the Holy Spirit do his work. This starts with an attitude that says everyone I meet or come in contact with is my need. It means getting down to the trenches where the needy lack food, clothing, jobs, and education, and Jesus. It means being willing to leave our comfort zone and going to the only zone some people know, a zone of helplessness and hopelessness. So many of us are followers of Jesus today willing to serve our neighbor because Jesus reached out to us. That's why we're here today. We know Jesus reached out to us. He stopped by and saw that we were wounded by sin and, and, and the trouble it brings. He did not cross to the other side pretending we did not exist. Like that last part where he tells the victim, gets him to the end, and he says, hey, You give me whatever he needs, and I'll take care of it. If it's anything beyond your capacity, I'll take care of it when my return is. Jesus slipped in that second coming. All the people out here inside this church and out there where Jesus has stopped by. He's got us to the end. You see what I'm saying? The church is the end. He got us here. And then he says, there's anything further. When I come back, I will pay the bill in full. You that the bill and call your needs to get sick of it. I'm not talking to people today that don't care. I'm not even worried about that. That's not the issue here today. I've come to know enough of you enough in general that this congregation here cares. It's not even my word. There's not even an insensitivity in here to not care. Let me just get busy sometimes. But Satan does a good job of all of us, especially Christians, of pointing out to ourselves our own need. We can get wrapped up in that. See, Jesus doesn't point out all that stuff. He only points out your one consistent need. That's him. That's all. That's all. And, and when we're here, we kind of realize that we, we even come for that. We realize that we need Jesus, so 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 we're here. But 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 it, it can expand to other things because remember Satan's on the other side of that. This war is not between us and Satan. This war is between Jesus and Satan. Satan trying to take us one way by showing us a God that couldn't care over this world. And Jesus is trying to tell us that the world really is not your problem. The poor you'll always have written, that's not your problem. 
Your problem is needing me, and when you get me, I'll show you how I'll use you in the world. But if you want to approach this from social pro uh, uh, programs, the son of going to work. Thank you. But until those social programs are begun on your knees, praying to Jesus about how you can help, they're just going to be social programs. Some people getting help, some of the money being wasted, on and on and on and on. And that's why in this project, it does not make a difference how expert we are. Do you realize that your own regional elders came up with this? God bless them. But we're sinners. Elder Conway is an expert. This is what he does daily, is deal with the abuse. But we need prayer. It's just a blessing from the Lord that our leader of the project is next. I don't know all of you, all of your applications, but when it comes to helping people, I know that Mary's been involved, I know Sue's been involved. We have talent. But we need Jesus. I don't consider myself an expert. But I do take pride in the fact that I know how to talk to people about Jesus one-on-one. -on -one and, and point them in a direction of believing in Jesus and accepting Jesus that Jesus cared. Expert or not, I still need Jesus. Because this ain't about book knowledge. This isn't about I do this every day, so I don't need to think about it. Don't get too overwhelmed by realizing that your name is terrible to pronounce it. It can be a daunting task. I guess I'll just have to figure out how do I really share what I know about Jesus in my own little cul de sac of 18 homes. The neighborhood has 80 homes. Pray, okay? Let's pray. Pray, ask the Lord what you can do. This pastor's not going to try to suggest you. We have this project. You can join Team It's True. But you can also pray when you join Team Now. And I still am going to keep reiterating prayer is the main thing. Some of us just can't get around. We just can't. God is allowed. But if the brain is working. And the lips can move, and I'll even go this far, even if the lips can't move, but the brain is working. And some of our prayers, we should pray silently anyway. You know, Satan tried to have somebody listen to him. We he can tell from our whole attitude whether we kneel or not that we're getting ready to go to prayer, and he's angry. Because he's trying to do enough to us to say, You're still praying to that God? You're still looking to him? You're still suggesting that there's a God that really cares about you? Praise. Praise God. Now, Lord, we want to serve our community. And we want to leave the results of that into your hands. We need your blessing on all that we do, not, not just this project. We have lots of projects that we either can't get kicked off, don't have enough people. Us having ideas is, is not our issue. Us joining in and carrying out even one idea is the issue. Be with us. Bless this church as it's such a lovely church with lovely people, good people. You've blessed me with that to be able to humbly serve three churches with really good people who love me. We are kind of beat up for it, it's true. But we love you. And 
we need your help to serve. Get us focused. Put that in your hands. Thank you for the time for what you need to do. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 